Okay, dear colleagues, today is the second day of our seminar, where is lecture of Nobel Prize winner, Professor Jean-Pierre Sauvage. And I think we can start our seminar today without any additional introduction. Dear Professor Savage, please. Thank you, Valentin, thank you. So today uh, we will speak about molecular machines and motors, as you see on the title of the lecture. And this will be to a large extent, a continuation of uh, the lecture I gave two days ago because we are going to use catenanes, in particular interlocking rings, uh, to set molecular systems in motion. So something very important to start with. If you look at your molecules, or generally speaking, the molecules made by chemists, uh, we tend to consider that they are almost static objects. Not in the sense that they do not move, but simply they move, of course, they distort, they vibrate, uh, but we have basically no control on their motions. And so they move in a stochastic fashion, in a random fashion. This is for the synthetic molecules. Now let's look at molecular systems found in biology. It is exactly the opposite. In biology, control molecular motion is absolutely essential and you will find it everywhere. We will find rotary motors, linear motors. We will even see walkers, uh, systems which can contract or elongate. So these systems, mostly belonging to the very wide family of motor proteins, as indicated here, are extremely important and universal. Now, before we start doing chemistry, uh, it's important to know more or less uh, what is going on in biology. And I thus would love to discuss two particularly important examples, ATP synthase, which is a rotary motor, and kinesin, which is a walker. So maybe some of you, if not all of you, um, know how ATP is made in uh, our body, in any living organism's body. Um, it is made out of ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and the enzyme which, which is responsible for the synthesis of ATP is called ATP synthase. Of course, it is the same enzyme which will convert ATP to ADP, and in this case, we will say ATP8. ATP synthase is a relatively big enzyme, uh, roughly 10 nanometers uh, width and uh, perhaps 50 nanometers uh, uh, high. And um, this enzyme, of course, is essential. Uh, you certainly know that every day uh, we make roughly one half of our weight of ATP. So personally, I prepare 37 or 38 kilos of ATP every day from ADP and uh, inorganic phosphate. And this enzyme has been studied for years and years, and uh, maybe between 20 and 25 years ago, some very important discoveries were made. And there was a Nobel Prize actually on the uh, understanding of uh, ATP synthase. It's a rotary motor. And uh, so let's go back to here. So this part here is rotating. And uh, I'm sorry, this part is fixed and this part is rotating. Maybe you can see that there is some kind of axis or shaft and this will spin rapidly. And um, it was, very difficult to demonstrate that, but some people did some beautiful work. They attached some uh, a filament, a very long filament at the end of the rotor. And this very long filament, they could uh, observe it, they could visualize it, and they could show that the filament moves as the system is rotating. So this is the, the beautiful video. It's an experimental piece of work not theory, uh, which was published 
uh, as I said, 25 years ago um, by um, a Japanese group. And you can see the filament. It's a very long filament of actin. And this filament is fluorescent, which allows us to observe it. And clearly, it shows that the system is undergoing a rotary motion. Of course, this has been uh, complemented by many, many very detailed studies. And you can find on the internet uh, several videos which are really impressive. And you should know that these videos are not science fiction. And in particular, this video is based on experimental facts. And there were many, many studies. And I think we know in a very convincing way how the system behaves. So ATP synthase is embedded in a membrane here, uh, which is a part of the mitochondria. And um, as ATP uh, is uh, synthesized, uh, ADP and inorganic phosphate are consumed. So you can see again here, uh, the shaft or the axis, which is rotating. And, um, ATP is purple, it will be expelled like here. And ADP and inorganic phosphate are respectively yellow and blue, blue for the very tiny phosphate. And so on the video, it is uh, very slow, uh, but it can be incredibly fast. And if you have a lot of ATP, which is the fuel, if you have a lot of ATP, uh, you can rotate the system uh, at the speed of a Formula One engine, 10,000 around per minute. So this is very impressive. It's one of the most important uh, enzymes on Earth because you have to remember that everything which lives on the planet here is based on ATP, even the most primitive bacteria. Now, another uh, molecular machine found in biology uh, which is equally impressive, is kinesin. And the kinesin is a walker. Uh, its main function in the cell is to transport matter from one spot in the cell to another spot very far away from the original spot. And it, in a way, it makes sense because in the cell, you have those uh, biosynthetic factories uh, which make uh, nucleosides, nucleotides, uh, fragments of proteins, hormones, um, whatever you might think of. And these molecules cannot stay at the same place where they have been made in the cell. So you need some kind of carrier to transport them where they are needed, perhaps very far away from where they have been made. And the kinesin, this is its function. So the kinesin is this tiny thing here. And you see that it walks. It walks on a microtubule, a very, very long tube, uh, which is used for the, the kinesin to walk on. It has two feet. Uh, the biologists call that the two heads of the kinesin. But to normal people like us, it is more similar to feet. And at the back, you have some, a big bag, a huge bag, which is uh, full of the molecules which have been transported from one place to another place in the cell. And this is, of course, very impressive. Here again, the system is incredibly efficient. Uh, if you think that this is about the same size as a human, you can have some idea uh, about the, the rate at which the system is running. And it runs at maybe 200 kilometers an hour which allows the kinesin to cross the cell in less than one second. So very impressive molecular machines. And of course, chemists are very far away from being able to reproduce this type of complexity. This is clearly um, obvious. Now, why did we talk about cationates, or very briefly, of rotaxanes yesterday? It's very clear. These molecules are ideally suited to generate molecular machines. So let's take rotaxane here, another rotaxane here, a cationane here. And it is 
very clear that if you can set your systems in motion, maybe you can make molecular machines. In particular here, you have something which could be similar to a linear motor, uh, similar to a piston moving in a cylinder, by just setting the ring in motion from the left of the axis, I'm sorry, from the left of the axis to the right. And the same here, you are getting close to a rotary motor uh, if you are able to make systems similar to those represented here in a very simple way. So now you understand probably why cationes and rotaxanes uh, seem to be so important, mostly in relation to molecular machines. Now let me start with the very first system we made in Strasbourg, uh, and it was published many years ago, the same year as the work of our very good friend, Fraser Stoddart, uh, the other Nobel laureate in this field. And I will start with this particular system. It will be a catenane, which is able to pirouette. So very simple coordination chemistry. You have to remember that copper has basically two stable ions, copper one plus, monovalent copper, and copper two plus, divalent copper. There is also a, uh, another oxidation state, plus three, but this is much more exotic. So let's start from here. We have here a cationane, which is similar, roughly similar to the first cationane we had seen yesterday, but it is also slightly modified. We have introduced a fragment, which is here, which contains three nitrogen atoms. And this fragment in coordination chemistry is known as terpyridine, because we have three pyridine. For the moment, we start from copper one. So all the parts uh, on the left here is concerned with copper one. And here on the right, we have copper two plus, divalent copper. Now we start from here. Copper one is a D10 electronic configuration metal, D10, which means that it's not a real transition metal. So D10 uh, transition metals are very happy are strongly stabilized if they have a tetrahedral geometry for their ligands. So copper one is very stable because it is surrounded by four nitrogen atoms arranged in a tetrahedral arrangement. Now we will oxidize copper one to copper two. So we abstract an electron at a certain potential and we generate copper two plus. Now copper two is D9. And D9 means that uh, it's a real transition metals. And there is some ligand field, which has to be take, taken into account. And copper two doesn't like to be four coordinate. It prefers to be five or six coordinated. So the system which is here is very unstable and it will rearrange as soon as it can. The ring which is here will glide undergo a 180 degrees uh, motion so as to gener generate a new system for which the copper two center is now five coordinated. This fragment has kicked out the other fragment and it replaced it in the coordination sphere of the copper two center. Now we have a very stable copper two. Um, everybody is happy and we can go back. We reduce copper two back to copper one. And of course, this is strongly destabilized and the system will pirouette again and we will regenerate the starting form of the molecule. So that was the very first system. It has weak points. And the first weak point, which is not so important because it can be modified, is that it's a very sluggish, very slow system to move. It takes minutes here and seconds here. And more important, we have no control over the directionality. So the system can rotate clockwise or counterclockwise, but we cannot control uh, this effect. 
I have a video here which might help you visualize the system. Uh, so copper one is most of the time purple or brown purple. Copper two is green. And uh, we start from the copper one system, which is very stable, as, as I said. And we will abstract an electron and generate copper two plus, which will force the system to rearrange. Now we have a stable five coordinating copper two, which we can reduce back to copper one, etc. And it can move this way, uh, pirouette, so to say, or oscillate uh, infinitely. Uh, we never noticed any degradation whatsoever. So that was the very beginning. And in, in our group, of course, we were not satisfied with uh, systems that was moving uh, so uh, slowly. And so we spent a lot of time, 12 years or even more, uh, trying to improve the systems. And uh, within, let's say, 12 years, uh, we could go from uh, seconds to minutes for the very first system we have seen before to microseconds to milliseconds. So for instance, for a pirouetting rataxain, as shown here, um, we could uh, have a system which moves within uh, microseconds. So that was a nice improvement. Now at the same time as our pirouetting uh, or oscillating catenane, uh, Professor Studdard and his group made a molecular shuttle. What is a molecular shuttle? Very simple. You take a hot taxane now, very simple hot taxane, and you assume that the ring can be set in motion from a position somewhere here to another position somewhere here and go back. And that would be a molecular shuttle. And so this is what they proposed. They made a molecular shuttle, as I said, the same year as our pirouetting catenane. And I think it's a beautiful piece of work. It's really uh, pioneering uh, work. So they take rotaxane with a relatively long filament here. They have two stations, a green station, which is a very strong electron donor, donor and a red station, which is a very weak electron donor, it's a dye ether. And uh, if you have, of course, uh, this, uh, they call it the blue box, it's a very strong electron acceptor. If you have this very strong electron acceptor at the beginning, it will be happy to interact with the very strong electron donor, no doubt. And now you send a signal to the molecule, you oxidize the green station, you generate a radical cation, which of course has no interest in interacting with uh, the, the blue ring here. So the blue ring will be repelled, go to the right, so as to interact with the weak electron donor. And it can go back if you reduce back the radical cation to the neutral form of the, the diamine. So from that, I think it started really to develop. The field uh, started to uh, attract more and more people. And I think the, one of the extensions, uh, which was proposed many years later by Stoddart, uh, was particularly attractive. Uh, so they took a very long rotaxane, uh, which can act as a shuttle by, again, moving the blue ring from this station to this other station and going back. And they attached both ends to nano electrodes, very tiny electrodes. And they could show that you can generate a system uh, which is able to um, store information, uh, process information. And of course, it is based on molecules. So this is, as far as I know, the first uh, uh, molecular system uh, towards uh, molecular computing, or at least uh, molecular storage and processing of information. So this is very unfortunate, but after this brilliant piece of work, I think nobody continued. 
Uh, and uh, today, I don't think it's a very active field of research. And I believe that I know the answer. Why isn't it more active? Because these molecules are relatively fragile. And if you have stored information, let's say you have done uh, 1,000 times um, writing, reading, erasing, writing, reading, erasing, the system starts to degrade very significantly. But if we can find molecular systems which are stable enough, I think it's, it is certainly worthwhile thinking or rethinking uh, the way we could uh, process information using molecules. Now, let me talk briefly about uh, the work we have been doing later on, much later on, on uh, molecular muscles, artificial molecular muscles. Uh, so that piece of work started uh, uh, something like 20 years ago. And I'm very happy to see that today, uh, many groups uh, are working on, uh, let's say, related systems, trying to make uh, very tiny muscles using molecules, synthetic molecules. So just at first, we have to remember how the muscles function. So we have a look here uh, at the sarcomere. And the sarcomere is the elemental unit of the muscle, mostly the striated muscle. And we have filaments. And I'm sure that many of you know that. You have the thick filament at the middle here in blue, which is the myosin. Uh, it can degrade ATP to ADP, so it functions uh, <coughs> as a um, energy provider, and we have thin filaments of actin. Thin filaments which can glide, and so when you contract your muscle, the filaments can glide along one another. You generate a shorter uh, muscle, and uh, when you are tired, you relax, uh, you go back to the elongated form, and it doesn't cost you any energy. So the idea was simple, but I should say that the synthesis was exceed, exceedingly difficult. And I would like to, again, to compliment those two brilliant uh, uh, scientists, two, two ladies, uh, Cello and Christian Dietrich Grishaker for being able to make the molecule. And it took them probably close to 35, no, 25 uh, uh, chemical steps to make it. I'm, I'm sorry, but we have no time to discuss in detail the work, but the principle is indicated here. We have a rotaxane dimer uh, with, uh, let's say, a pale blue component containing a string and a ring, and a dark blue component, which consists of a, a dark blue axis and a dark blue ring. And we could show that by sending a signal to the molecule, we can contract it from eight nanometers to about six nanometers. And by sending another signal, we can go back to eight nanometers. So the, that was the first uh, uh, rotaxane dimer uh, acting as a tiny muscle. And we were also happy to show that it has some analogy with real muscles in the sense that you have two filaments which glide along one another. So this is the real molecule. And I think it will perhaps be a little bit difficult to, uh, to completely understand. Um, so the process is metal exchange. So this is the chemical reaction. We exchange copper for zinc or zinc for copper. And so we start here uh, on a copper complex species. So here we have a tetrahedral copper. Here we have also a tetrahedrally coordinated copper. And waiting for better times, we have the third dentate ligands, one here, one here, which again are terpyridines uh, in a similar way as the very first oscillating or pirouetting catenate. Uh, we had made much before. And so we will start from here to copper one. Now let's kick out the copper one and replace it for zinc. 
Z wants to be five coordinated so that the system will contract. Again, we can kick out zinc, replace it for copper, etc. So we can contract, we can elongate at will, but of course, it's not a very nice system in the sense that it's a metal exchange process. It's not a photochemical process or, or an electrochemically driven process, uh, but this has been made, now this has been demonstrated in many, many systems by a beautiful work, a much more modern work uh, for which the, the people could prepare uh, filaments and materials which can be contracted or elongated at will by changing the pH, for instance, or by sending an electrochemical signal. Uh, but this is the very first uh, so-called molecular muscle that uh, we made. Now let me talk about something totally different, again, inspired by nature. In nature, you know that our proteins, or everybody's proteins, uh, they gradually degrade uh, because they are denatured. They are slowly denatured. This is uh, typically the case for the proteins which are uh, fun functioning as enzymes. And, uh, and those enzymes are gradually denatured. But uh, biology is very clever. And instead of throwing away the denatured proteins, they are recycled, like basically everything in biology. They are recycled thanks to the chaperones or chaperonins. And these chaperones uh, assemble and they form a huge cavity. So there is a big, big cavity um, in which the, the denatured protein can be uh, inserted, can be accommodated, and then there will be some uh, mechanical action on the protein, um, kind of massage, if you will like. So it will be contracted, it will be elongated at some parts, and after some time, uh, the protein is again in good shape, as if it was completely new, it will be kicked out and go back to work. Beautiful system. And of course, we are totally unable to prepare something of such complexity. But we thought that it would, it would be of interest uh, to make a molecular system that would act as a compressor, just to show that chemists can make complex systems uh, vaguely reminiscent of a biological system. So that was the target we had in mind. It's a four hotaxane, four because there are four components, an axis here, another axis here, a bis macrocycle here, and another bis macrocycle. And so we embarked in this uh, project uh, with um, quite a large uh, part of my group, very, very talented people again. And uh, the target, which we drew before making it. It's very easy to draw the molecules. Uh, it is much more complicated to make them, but the molecule we drew, which was the project, is represented here. So as you see, we have a, an axis here with two big stoppers at the same year, an axis with two big stoppers, and vertically, you have those two beast microcycles. So a ring here with a copper, a ring here with a copper, and here the two important parts, which will be the plates, which will allow us to insert something in between and then compress what has been inserted. This is the guest. So very ambitious, uh, but in a way, uh, it was reasonably easy to make the molecules. I think easy is not the proper word, but not exceedingly difficult because of symmetry. So we have several elements of symmetry, and this makes the synthesis much easier than for a totally asymmetric system. So we could make the molecule, we will not discuss the synthesis, and even more, we could obtain an X-ray structure of it. So this is the X-ray structure. Uh, it's a big molecule, as you can see, molecular weight of 9,000 or so. And we have exactly you know, what we had expected, 
the two um, uh, the two axes uh, with the big stoppers and the two base microcycles. And the, the plates, the porphyrinic plates, they are zinc porphyrins. The two plates are maybe 10 angstroms apart from one another, which allows us to put something in between those two plates. So if I move it, you will probably uh, see the structure better. And so we could insert in between the two plates um, uh, small molecules uh, using the, the zinc, zinc ions as Lewis acids uh, to complex dye basic systems. Um, uh, by, for four prime bipyridine or uh, related dye amines. And so after that, uh, we felt that uh, it was time to set the system in motion. And what it, we had in mind was to remove the copper. And you will see that if we remove the copper, the system rearranges completely. The geometry will be totally modified. And we have to keep in mind that we have triazoles here, 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 and here. And triazoles are ligands, they are very weak ligands. But if they could interact with the zinc ions of those porphyrins, they would be happy. And if we remove the coppers, of course, the rigidity of the molecule is totally lost. The system becomes very flexible. And so I will show you what happens. Again, this is not science fiction. This is an X-ray structure, which we have seen. And the, the final product after removal of, the, um, of those copper one ions has been studied by very detailed NMR so that we know exactly the geometry of the system. So let's start. We move the system just for you to visualize it. The two plates are here. Now we take out the copper and you see that the triazoles are getting closer and closer to the zinc ions. So the system is completely smashed, completely different in terms of uh, geometry. And of course, what was in between the two porphyrins is getting compressed and of course, finally expands. And so this is why we, we called it a compressor or a switchable receptor. It is totally reversible. If we introduce copper uh, in the system, we regenerate, regenerate quantitatively uh, the starting form of the body. So this is the conclusion on this part. Uh, we can flatten the rataxane and thus show that uh, what is inserted in between those two plates is contracted and finally expelled. So I would like to make it clear that uh, a lot of work had been already devoted to molecular machines. Uh, the people did not, not always call them uh, molecular machines, but they are somewhat similar to molecular machines. And um, of course, uh, the work with rotaxanes and catenanes boosted enormously the field. Uh, but let me just mention two very nice pieces of work, uh, which are very old. You know, old doesn't mean of no interest. Old can be very exciting. And there was some beautiful work by Shinkai and his group, Seiji Shinkai in Japan. And in 1985, uh, the people were using uh, uh, azobenzene as a, let's say, movable species because you can uh, go from the trans form to the cis form by um, photo irradiating uh, the molecule. And so you start from this species, it's a crown ether. And the crown ether uh, is attached to a small chain containing an ammonium ion. And normally, primary ammonium ions are recognized by crown ethers and you form complexes. But in this case, there is no way because this is rigid and the transform doesn't allow the molecule to fold up so as to have the ammonium ion interacting with the, the carnitine. Now you shine light on that. 
you generate the cis form. And of course, now <coughs> the cis form is very well adapted to complexation of the ammonium ion, and you form this new species. Call it or not a molecular machine, I don't know, but I think it was a very exciting, very imaginative piece of work, uh, which I would like to, to share with you. Uh, another example, um, in a way it's touching, you know, to see the, um, the figures. So that was the figures in the, the 70s that the people were able to make. Uh, you take a cyclodextrin, which is, as you know, a big receptor, beta cyclodextrin, with its uh, seven uh, glucose units. And uh, it's a big receptor, big cavity is present. And uh, you can block here, or you can liberate uh, the entrance of the cavity. So you have, let's say, kind of a cylinder. It's not a real cylinder, but close to a cylinder. If you have the transform, nothing can enter. Now you shine light, again, you generate the seed form, and the, the cavity opens. Uh, it becomes accessible to small molecules, and you can put something in there. Uh, and I think it's a nice system, again, if you heat a bit, you will regenerate the, the thermodynamically most stable form, which is the trans azobenzene form. So now let me spend a few minutes on the first line driven rotary motor, uh, which was made by Feringa and his group. And uh, I think it is really a fantastic piece of work. Uh, which was published in Nature in uh, 1999. But the original drawings, I'm sorry to say, uh, were not so good. And it was somewhat difficult to understand what was going on. And it has been rapidly redrawn by uh, Credi, Balzani, and the Bologna School. Uh, I think one can better understand what's going on with these drawings. So you have a double bond. It's a sterically hindered double bond. And probably you may remember your uh, organic photochemistry lectures. And if you have a sterically hindered double bond, when you excite it, photo excite it, it will photo isomerize. And so this is exactly what happens. You shine light, UV light, on this molecule and the double bond here will photo isomerize. And you generate another photo. And so that was the beginning. And I think the most beautiful part of the work is that they waited. And they waited for some time. And this molecule continued to rotate. So there was an additional rearrangement uh, which took place, which was thermal. And you go from here to here. So there is some kind of rotation motion which goes up. And they noticed this and they had the third form on which they continue to shine light and by shining light you do the photoisomerization reaction very classical reaction you generate the fourth form of the molecule and if you heat a bit or if you are very patient you wait for hours and hours you regenerate the starting form of the molecule so that was the very beginning of rotary motors. Um, and they, Ben Feringa and his group, they published on the web a beautiful video, uh, which I hope you will probably more easily understand. So we have the double bond here, it is sterically hindered. And if you remember here, you have, you have four signals. You shine light, you heat. You shine light, you heat. And the same will be true here. Now we heat, we shine light, we heat, we shine light. So each time you shine light, you have a big flash. And when you heat, of course, you have this symbol for heating the balls. I'm not sure you can visualize it. I strongly hope you can, but if not, I'm very sorry, I cannot help you. 
So that was the very beginning. And I should say that it, it opened up completely a new field. And nowadays they can uh, uh, rotate the, the molecular motor uh, within uh, microseconds or even uh, nanoseconds. And uh, I think it is one of the, the most important contributions to the field of uh, molecular machines. I would like also to show you what they, they did. Um, so they used this system. This is already an old piece of work, but magnificent in my opinion, to show that you can convert uh, a molecular motion, a rotary motor, into something which is really macroscopic, real objects. And so they will start from a liquid crystal film. And in this liquid crystal film, they will incorporate those tiny motors. So this is the, now the new tiny motor they incorporated in the liquid crystal film. Uh, so this is a cholesteric phase, a very classical uh, liquid crystal, uh, bidimensional uh, arrangements. And uh, this um, liquid crystal film will contain 1% as a dopant of this molecule. And of course, keep in mind that if you shine light here, you will start the rotary motion. So this has a, a classical fingerprint texture uh, for cholesteric phases, very classical. And there is 1% of the, the tiny molecule. Now they shine light. It takes time and it has been sped up. You know, it takes more time than what you see. It takes time and you see that the fingerprint structure is now globally moving. So you rearrange the system and after a while it will start to degrade and it is less and less organized, of course. But this is really nice to think that uh, using one person of a tiny molecular mo motor, uh, you can completely uh, force the, the complete uh, cholesteric phase uh, to rotate, to undergo this kind of rotation motion. And then they went a little bit further and they decided to use a very tiny rod made out of glass, which they put on the surface of the liquid crystal. And again, they will uh, shine light. So they shine light and you see that the, the tiny bar here, which is, uh, in a micron or tens of microns um, range can be again rotated. Of course, the, this is idealized. I mean, it takes much more time than uh, what you see on the slide. I think it has been sped up by a factor of, I don't know, 30 or so. But this is a remarkable um, piece of work. So let me just summarize what I said in terms of um, fields. Uh, so the field started with uh, pirouetting catenanes, molecular shuttles, and rotary motors. So that was Strasbourg, um, California, or England, uh, with Fraser Stoddart and Feringa in Groningen, in the north of uh, the Netherlands. And then the field gradually developed uh, more and more rapidly. And I would like to say that there are now many groups doing fantastic work in this field. I have a special, uh, special respect uh, for David Lee and his group. Uh, they are really incredibly creative. So David Lee is nowadays in uh, Manchester in the UK, and they have been doing uh, fantastic work. Uh, they try to make a walker similar to kinesin. And they succeeded. They made something which can walk three steps. Uh, they made something which is even more um, um, ambitious, trying to mimic the ribosome, uh, which is about to, uh, as you know, to synthesize our proteins, to synthesize uh, uh, polypeptides. And they could make a, a small peptide, a tripeptide, um, in a totally selective way. Uh, which is, of course, 
similar to a, a very naive, a very simple ribosome, because the ribosome is probably the most complex uh, uh, molecular machine in the world. Um, so you may wonder, so where does it go? Do you have any idea in terms of applications? Uh, in which field uh, should we expect to find applications? I must say that I asked myself the question to myself and to my colleagues. Uh, it is very difficult to answer today. We can just give maybe a few lines you know, for the future. Um, as far as I know, there is only one commercial application of rotaxanes, polyrotaxanes. And uh, this is uh, mostly the work of Professor, Professor Ito and Professor Okumura in Japan. And uh, uh, this, these are commercial uh, films. Uh, and the molecules are very mobile because they are attack stains. And the long chains you see here can glide freely so that the, the films um, have very mobile molecular components so that if you scratch the film, very rapidly, it will self repair. This is, it's not a revolution, but I think it's an interesting application. Uh, another uh, list, perhaps, uh, as I said, storing and processing information uh, could be exciting. Uh, personally, I believe more in uh, micro robots, nano robots, uh, in medicine. Uh, very tiny muscles, again, in medicine or in, uh, in uh, robotics. Uh, and second, perhaps even more important um, possibility would be um, targeting um, toxic species or targeting malignant cells in the body and then sending a molecular machine uh, which will carry the drug and the drug will be delivered close to the malignant cell, let's say, or close to the virus or the bacterium, and then kill it. Uh, <clears throat> I will finish up by thanking the people who've done the work. It's a highly collective piece of work. I'm just the one uh, who gives the lectures, but uh, some, some others also give lectures on this work. Uh, as I said before, I think in the French system, we could work with permanent people, professors or CNRS researchers. Many PhD students, many postdocs participated. Uh, their names are here. Uh, the muscle was made by Maria Consuelo Jimenez in association to Christian Dutrich Buschecker. Uh, the work on the um, a compressor or a receptor. Uh, so this is the, this list of people, very, um, very nice, very motivated people. Um, so I would like to thank them uh, again for their beautiful work. <coughs> I will finish up by thanking my university, uh, the CNRS, and uh, the European communities. Again, my uh, second university, Northwestern University uh, in the US uh, near Chicago, uh, ISIS, the institute uh, founded by Jean-Marie Lane, and they welcomed me uh, when I moved from my former position, uh, and uh, my family, these two great scientists, uh, and uh, Fraser Stutter and Ben Feringa. And finally, if I still have one or two minutes, um, I just would like to make a few remarks. A few remarks mostly for young scientists. They may say, well, it's not your business. Maybe they are right. But I would like to tell them that uh, there are some important things which should be uh, taken into account. If you want to start your own research, novelty should come first. This is the priority, in my opinion. I just give you my opinion. It is also very important to interact with 
other scientists, uh, to talk to, you, to maybe your competitors, uh, talk to your colleagues, go to meetings, try to encounter other people with whom you will interact. And uh, encounters, to me, are really determining. Of course, you should also trust the young scientists who are working in your group. They are more than people are doing experimental work. They are people who think. They are people who have some ideas, who are very, can be very creative. And uh, so we should interact with our young people. And perhaps this is something very special for, for our case jumping from a field in which you feel very familiar to another field uh, which you are not so familiar with can be very beneficial. And this is what we did. We were very comfortable. We felt very comfortable with inorganic photochemistry, electrocatalysis, uh, water splitting, ruthenium trees by pyridine, and things like that. And at some stage, we decided to jump into the field of catenates, which was almost virgin. And that was good. And if you do not dare to do that, keep in mind that um, if you fail, nobody is going to kill you. Uh, you can go back to your more traditional field and start a new project in this more traditional field. And finally, for us, it has also been important uh, be careful if there is some experimental facts which you do not understand, you know, which seem to be very surprising. Do not systematically throw away everything. Try to understand why you observe what you observe. And maybe there is something hidden behind the observation. And it could be that you will find something very important. And there are many Nobel Prize discoveries uh, which, were, which are completely due to serendipity. So happy accident. And on this, I will stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your lecture, very interesting lecture. It really, these two lectures uh, are interlinked one with another. And so thank you for your final remarks for for students, for PhD students, and for scientists. Okay, dear, dear colleagues, do you have any questions to our lecture? Yes, um, can I ask some question? Of course, yes. Um, if you please open the slide where you show the model of working uh, muscle muscles, artificial yes. muscles. Uh, you mean, yeah, the muscle, uh, yeah, this, this, yes, um, the next, please. Okay. Um, there we see that, um, they quite, um, symmetrical, uh, I mean, um, the cuprum and the zinc is, um, um, uh, in in two part of this uh, molecule, but yeah. can we imagine the molecules as just have one uh, part that are um, make uh, moves the system, but another yeah, one, one half. One half, you mean? Yes, yes, just one half. Uh, it gets here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I think just maybe it uh, will be easy uh, to um, you know it we. It will be quickly uh, working. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is an excellent point. You're right. Uh, this is we made it. You, we made one half of this molecule, mm -hmm. and it was moving. You're absolutely right. Okay. Uh, just um, may you sh say what's um, what's title or what's uh, journal is writing about that? Is it uh, that, article? That's what, yeah, that was published in Angevante Chemie. Sorry. Angevante Chemie. And uh, let me say why it works if we have one half of the molecule mm -hmm. and it doesn't work if we have the complete system. We, we understood after work, you know, we understood why it didn't work uh, electrochemically, because that was the point. You know, we would we would like it to work electrochemically. Here, 
it has to be a concerted mechanism. So the two fragments have to glide at exactly at the same time. And so if you have some kind of uh, kinetic barrier, you know, an activation barrier, in a way, if they have to work exactly at the same time, instead of doing this and that, you multiply the barrier, uh, the activation barrier by two, a factor of two. And so we had a very high barrier. Okay. Okay. So uh, so how, how, uh, how fast we can switch this uh, muscle for practical uh, application? <laughs> Well, for practical application, here it's very bad. You know, it is mostly the principle. Because if you have to do a chemical reaction, it will not lead you towards applications. But that was mostly the principle which we wanted to demonstrate. Uh, we were disappointed that it didn't work electrochemically. But many other groups, you know, uh, in the last 15 years or so, uh, continued, you know, and they, they were more imaginative than us in a way, and they found the right systems. And so you can have very similar systems now, which can move very fast, you know, uh, microseconds or so, uh, but using very different systems. The principle, you know, of moving systems like this is the same, but the chemical reactions are not the same. Okay. Uh, Professor Kamarov, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for such a fantastic lecture and the work is really exciting. Uh, I have a general question. I wonder if there would be possible to develop a molecule, a molecular machine, which would be driven solely by heat. So by browning motion, uh, yeah, just, yeah. just browning, molecular machine. Is, is there any ideas how to do this? That's a very good point. This is, in a way, biological machines work, in a way. You know, biological machines utilize a Brownian motion, Brownian energy, and uh, they move. And then what you need is some ratchets. This is the ratchet principle. The That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there are examples with artificial machines uh, mostly thanks to the work of David Lee, whom I, whom I mentioned, I think at some stage uh, in my, yeah, David Lee, yeah, I think it's the, David Lee. And they have been doing that, you know, they have, let's say a rotaxane um, and uh, very simple shuttle. You know? And so everything moves very fast. And at some stage, they can activate the ratchet. So the ring will glide to the right, to the left, to the right. And at some stage, they activate the ratchet so that the ring will stay on the right part of the molecule. And they can deactivate it and the ring will glide again. And uh, so this is one of the very rare examples of ratchet-based molecular machines. But you're absolutely right that in biology, you know, this is uh, absolutely general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here is to uh, Vladimir Berist. Thank you very much for the lecture. And uh, my question is uh, regarding how a viscous environment uh, could affect uh, the energy required to uh, activate your system. For example, is the energy of a photon uh, will be enough to switch them and allow to walk in, uh, in this viscous surrounding? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <coughs> well, I have only very good questions, but it's great. So this is, all, again, a very difficult question because it will depend on the system. In our case, you know, we are using coordination chemistry. And so coordination chemistry means that you have to decoordinate some ligands, the system will move, and then you re-coordinate another ligand to stabilize everything. And in this case, the coordinating properties of the solvents are extremely important. Let's take an example. So we have a 
uh, the first uh, oscillating system uh, which I showed, uh, this one. And if you take now copper one and copper two, uh, each time you oxidize or reduce, you re rearrange the coordination sphere of the metal. And if you have a non-coordinating solvent, it takes time, it's stable. It, it can be basically fixed, you know, frozen. But if you have a coordinating fragment, the system can move very rapidly because some solvent molecule might stabilize some half-naked cation, some, uh, some uh, uh, totally destabilized cation. And, and so the solvent is very important in our case. In some other cases, I think there are some examples, just a few studies, uh, where viscosity also has been uh, studied. And viscosity will also play a role, especially when you have very big uh, molecular systems which have to rearrange. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. So I just thought that probably uh, placing such systems into a kind of, uh, I don't know, isotropic media, like for instance, liquid crystals or uh, plasma membranes of cells yeah. could uh, facilitate somehow the, the performance of such machines. So just, yeah, I wonder if there's any dependence on the, on the type of medium viscosity and probably iotropy in the system just to, to help them to perform better. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's important, but for the moment there are only, you know, a few studies, but it's not very, very active in this field. What the people have done was try to attach those species onto surfaces. And if you attach a molecular machine on a surface, uh, I should say that in some cases, the system is completely different. Uh, in our case, we have not been very successful. Once it is attached onto an electrode, let's say, basically it doesn't move anymore. But some others have been more successful. Yeah, okay, and just in that, in that sense, probably another type of application could be uh, a sensor or probably, I don't know, controlled release of, of drugs in response to, to that uh, transformation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question and comments. Uh, Mikola Vinitsky, please. Uh, I would like to thank you, Monsieur. Uh, Swash for a great lecture and ask um, the question. I'm more interested in the applications of uh, such molecular machines in medicine. So uh, comparing, uh, say, um, biological molecular machines and uh, artificial, I probably can see that um, these artificial machines are working in more limited conditions. So uh, how can we um, like um, improve uh, they to say area of work uh, in a human cell, for example, uh, what has to be done and what are general like differences between these artificial molecules and um, real biological molecules? And the second part of question um, I would like to ask is, um, well, if we try to energetically optimize the uh, uh, function of such um, artificial molecule, um, like uh, making it uh, more similar to proteins, uh, uh, there is uh, more, like we, we will come to more complex molecules and um, at which point, uh, like um, the, overall energetical uh, efficiency will be, uh, so to say, close to biological systems uh, in a structural uh, way. Yeah, well, in a way, I think I can combine, you know, both uh, questions. Um, so first, you know, all the molecular, molecular machines which have been made till now uh, are not biocompatible, except a few examples by uh, Ben Feringa's group, uh, where they collaborate with uh, 
bio, biochemists or biologists, even, but very, very rare example. So our systems are not biocompatible, as you noticed. And uh, if I was able to continue my, my work in this field, uh, but I'm not, I think I would certainly try and make biocompatible molecular machines. And this shouldn't be so difficult. You know, you can uh, replace the bipyridines or phenanthrolines or whatever uh, by small uh, peptides. You know, some peptides can bind transition metals. Uh, you can add sugars, you can add whatever you like. That should be biocompatible. And then we can see what's going on if you inject it in a living organism. Uh, now, taking proteins, you know, big proteins, uh, I think you have to be a biochemist. You know, taking small amino acids or taking sugars, it's okay for chemists. But now moving towards real proteins, um, personally, I feel very far away from it. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, thank you a lot for your answer. Uh, I was just thinking about um, overall energetical efficiency because if we take ATP synthetase, that they are like very efficient uh, in the way they utilize protons and uh, uh, all that stuff. So, uh, it like <laughs> the third part maybe of my question it would be if it's principally possible to make uh, something comparable to biological machines. Yeah. I still believe it's very, very difficult because uh, you need some uh, transport. I mean, if you look at ATP, uh, if you look at any biological machine based on ATP degradation, ATP hydrolysis to ADP, uh, you have some proton transport across a membrane. And coupling a proton transport across a membrane plus the chemical reaction, I believe it is exceedingly difficult today. In the future, hopefully we will, we will be successful. But for the moment, you know, this proton transport uh, step is very, very difficult to make. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for your question and for your answer, okay. I didn't see more questions. Dear colleagues, do you have it? It seems no. <laughs> I, I did I have a good series of questions, you know. We cannot complain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's time, I think, to finish our seminar. First of all, I would like again thank you for your agreement to be a lecturer on Kharkiv Chemical Seminar for our Ukrainian scientists during this very very hard time for Ukraine during our war against uh, Russia aggression. And I hope uh, we will meet, I think, uh, all participants, maybe on conferences, maybe in France with you. And thanks again for your, <laughs> for your, for your support of Ukraine and our scientists. Thank so, you very much. Thank you. It was a real pleasure for me. So, on this on this note, please um, we'll finish our seminar. So, okay. about next seminar, I'll announce uh, soon. It will be it will be lecture at the end of this uh, month. Okay. So, okay. bye then. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.